Thanks, Dr. Ayers. We are so glad that you've come in and joined us tonight. And those of you who are not in your classes, because we have encouraged everybody to not be in their classes. Instead, what they're coming here is they're coming into this lecture series. And then at 745, it's if we're all in one big room together, we're all going to file back into our classes and go to our classes. The Chamberlain lectures have been happening for 35 years. This is the 34th annual chamber lecture because unfortunately during covid we didn't have this lecture series now i found out some very interesting things about the chamberlain lecture series and we went back and we found the original legal documents our own vice president for business affairs helped me find some of these and there's really interesting information in how they set up this endowment which created this lectureship now i found out too interesting enough that the Chamberlains, and they are Ray W. and Marianne E. Chamberlain, they were humble people in their own finances. They saved a lot of their money, and they lived in a mobile home in their own retirement so that they could be in a position to donate a lion's share of their resources at the end of their life. Now, interesting enough, another thing that happened is that their son became the president of Houghton College. So if you go back and you look and you'll find a Chamberlain in the 80s and 90s who served in that role. So they were committed to theological education and they endowed this position. They gave some very strict rules too with how it was to work to finance a yearly lectureship at Wesley Biblical Seminary, which will promote scriptural holiness as interpreted by John Wesley and as set forth in the seminary's confessional statement, which appears in its catalog and is recorded in the Hines County clerk's office. There's some specific legal language for you about holiness. There it is recorded in the Hines County legal office. Okay. There's, there's that function. So there is to be a process whereby we bring in somebody who's an expert in Wesleyan theology to speak on this subject. Now, another thing that I don't think the faculty is even aware of, we found another clause in this endowment. And this is what it says to also hold an annual contest for the best sermon on scriptural holiness among Wesley Biblical Seminary students. Did you all know that? Yeah. And look, and it goes even further. The first prize winner is to receive $100. Second prize, $50 in cash. Cash, Ethan, we need to have cash on hand when this happens. And the third prize winner will receive, a $25, will receive $25 in cash. Maybe they can fill up half their tank in gas with that. We'll figure out where that goes. So this might be something we need to look into instituting here, maybe in the spring. So we have not only the Chamberlain lectures, but the Cha Chamberlain sermon contest in order to be in compliance with this grant. So I think there's something really beautiful about the sacrifice this couple made. We received a letter from them late in her life, uh, Mary Ann's life, that is, before, after her husband was promoted to glory. She said this interesting thing as she, was, she wrote to us or actually somebody wrote it for her, her daughter wrote it for her. She said, it's interesting. She said this through her daughter, her daughter was writing. It's interesting how many people, how many good people, sorry, let me get this. It's interesting how good people become in folks' memory after they've been dead for a few years. And then she said, no telling how good folks will think I was after I've been gone a while. This is interesting. Well, we're thinking about Marianne tonight with thanks in our hearts for what she established, she and her husband, and how we get a benefit from the night. And we're thankful that we have one of the really upcoming, I don't know if you can say upcoming when somebody's in their 40s anymore, but I think it works. Upcoming Wesley scholars of our time here in Dr. Ryan Danker. Ryan, in his book, Wesley and the Anglicans, um, he wrote this book, it's published by IVP Academic, and if you were to see the back of it, you'll see that it's endorsed by Ken Collins and Randy Maddox. These are two people who've had very good, thorough disagreements through the years, but also really some of the top Wesley scholars. And they're saying this book and this scholar is somebody we should be listening to. And so it might be interesting for us just to hear a little bit about Ryan. Dr. Ryan Danker is a scholar of John and Charles Wesley, the Church of England, and the Evangelical Revival. He's the president of the Charles Wesley Society and assistant editor of Firebrand Magazine. He has degrees from Northwest Nazarene University, Duke University, and Boston University, and has served on the faculties of Greensboro College and Wesley Theological Seminary. He is the author of Wesley and the Anglicans, 
political division in early evangelicalism, and the editor of Exploring a Wesleyan Political Theology. Now, there's a phrase that recently has come back into prominence within the Wesleyan movement, and it has often been misinterpreted, and that's John Wesley's sentence that says, there is no holiness but social holiness. I mean, what's that supposed to mean? And what role does it mean for, what, what, what role do Christians take on in the public sphere? These are the type of questions that we brought Ryan in to help us think through in these three, three days. And it's connected to our mission to develop trusted leaders for faithful churches. If we're going to develop trusted leaders who can speak in their communities for faithful churches, they're necessarily going to be engaged in their communities, in the public square. So I think you'll see the connection between the Chamberlain's desire that we speak on holiness themes and how that hits the road in the real world. So we're really excited. I'd ask you to just take a minute and greet Dr. Denker with me. Ryan, will you come and we can pray for you? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come to you now with thanks in our hearts for the way you have been at work in Ryan's life, for the way you have used his scholarly abilities to give us a fuller picture of the church and what's happened in history. We pray that you would use this lectureship to help us be better equipped for the service of your church and your kingdom in this world. Thank you for the witness of John Wesley. Thank you for the Methodist movement. Thank you for Wesley Biblical Seminary and the way that you have brought all of these things together. We pray that we would be able to anticipate the way you are at work in the world around us and calling us to the public square. Lord, we pray that this would be a time where your Holy Spirit is working, even through an academic lecture. We say this all to the glory of our triune God and in Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder before Dr. Laker gets started, and I take my notes away from his notes. This is an academic lecture. And so we hope that as you are taking notes on what is being presented, that you'll be prepared for questions and answers that will happen at the end. I'll be moderating that. We have Dr. Matt O'Reilly, who's going to give an official response from the faculty. Um, but just be ready. And this is something that is a, not a sermon in the classic sense, but there will be a proclamation of the good news, I think, too. Ultimately. All right. Give Dr. Dink our hand again. All right. Thank you, Dr. Miller and Dr. Ayers. It, it really is a joy to be here, and I'm honored um, to have been asked uh, to do this lecture series. I'm, tonight, we are not fulfilling the Chamberlain lecture desire to talk about holiness. We're talking about politics um, uh, in a blunt almost bloody way, um, <laughs> but we will get to holiness. Now I will say, you know, the, the quotation that you brought up, Andy, of um, there is no holiness, but social holiness is a wonderful phrase and, and wonderfully misused. Um, but it, it's a good reminder, you cannot be holy on your own. Uh, that's what he meant. And so it's actually good in that regard to be here with you. And ultimately we will get to holiness. Um, we'll go on to perfection in these lectures, hopefully. How's that? Jeff, am I, am I on and everything? Okay, I wanted to make sure that was happening. So tonight, um, essentially, you're going to get the, the context. Uh, tomorrow is Wesley's political perspective, and then ultimately, hopefully on Wednesday, I can give you a bit more application. Um, but this evening, um, we're really diving into British history and English history in particular. And for those of you who are online, who like to look at chronologies and things, um, if you want to bring up, or even those in the room, if you need to look up a chronology of the monarchs, if you want to keep up with my uh, going through them rather quickly, um, then feel free to do so if you haven't already memorized the, the you know, the monarchs of Britain. Um, so the lecture. The, the, the political world that I want to describe, which is the political world of the 18th century in Britain, was actually launched with the blade of an ax that freed the head of Charles I from the rest of his body. This act, call it an execution, some call it a martyrdom, took place in the heart of Whitehall, which is the center of English power even to this day. And it took place on January the 30th, 1649. King Charles walked the last few steps of his life, ironically under images of his father, 
James the first in these images in the banqueting, uh, the banqueting house of the old palace of Whitehall, you have a triumphalist political display above your head. It's a, a striking display and I encourage you to go see it. But what is it? It's a display of divine right kingship. God had placed James on the throne. And by implication, God had also placed Charles on the throne. And yet here he is being led, chained, to scaffolding that had been set up outside of this beautiful banqueting hall. And he's led off, off a window. They, they had opened a window and he's led out of this banqueting hall onto the scaffolding above the street. And he's taken on this scaffolding. And it's interesting, of course, that you have a, a center there, a place of, of feasting, right? Of divine right monarchy and feasting. And here's Charles being led out. And what do they do? They summarily execute him on the scaffolding there above the streets of the capital. Before he, he is executed, he yells to the crowd after his uh, a rather long speech, he yells, remember. And what he means by that is remember what he's dying for. He's dying for the monarchy. He's dying for the church as he sees it. And he's dying for the episcopacy, which is the, the for those of you who don't use that word in common parlance, the episcopacy is, um, uh, the ordering of the church with bishops. So when the axe falls, the people are actually in shock. And we have reports of this, of people fainting in the street. How in the wide world could the Lord's anointed now be executed like a common criminal on the streets of Whitehall? What does this mean? Many yelled out with terror, in fact, when that axe fell. Some, we have records, they went underneath the scaffolding to try to soak up royal, now martyred blood. So the events that led to this execution, which of course is not the first in British history, nor was it the last, included what is often called the English Civil Wars. Note the plural. This was a complex set of wars that overtook the three kingdoms, dividing families, dividing neighbors, Christian against Christian across the country. In many of the churches to this day, they still bear the scars of this political battle. There are many currents to any civil war. I don't need to go into all the details behind that. We've had our own civil wars in this country. But in the English context, it was a battle in part over the source of power. Who was truly in charge of the kingdom? What sort of balance should there be, if any, between competing powers? And in this respect, it was a series of wars waged over the role of the monarchy and the role of parliament within that system. But let's look at some of the players, the Stuarts, beginning with James I, who, for the sake of context, and let's, I think this always helps. Yes, this is King James, as in the one who, who um, eventually, because of he didn't write the King James Bible, of course, but he authorized it, the King James Bible. Um, this, this James, the head of the Stuart uh, dynasty, he embraced, as I've described, a striking doctrine of divine right, kingship. For James, the monarch was not only appointed by God, the monarch spoke for God. And in fact, then put that together, that means to challenge the monarch is in fact to challenge God. And interestingly enough, this approach actually worked under James's reign because he was very politically astute. But it didn't work under his less politically savvy son, Charles, who repeatedly would clash with parliament and this was a parliament that was increasingly filled with members of the Puritan faction within the Church of England. I want to say this quickly because oftentimes, especially on our side of the pond, we think of Puritans as a separate religious group from Anglicans. And that's because of the history of Massachusetts and all that. We don't need to go into all that. But the Puritans, there's a reason they were called Puritans. They were trying to purify, right? And by the way, they didn't call themselves Puritans. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of these groups get nicknamed, and it wasn't necessarily a nice nickname to be called a Puritan, but they were within the Church of England. And I think we need to understand that, in, that for about 100 years, Puritans were a stream within the established church. But Charles, Charles I, the one I spoke about earlier, was not keen on the Puritan agenda for the church, nor was his archbishop, whose name was William Laud, 
who launched a series of liturgical and theological initiatives that actually returned aspects of England's Catholic past. And you can imagine what the Puritans thought of Laud. We have to keep in mind that the Church of England in the 1640s was not yet a settled ideal, nor according to some like Oliver Cromwell, who oversaw the execution of Charles I, was the idea of the monarchy. And so what we see in the English Civil Wars and the execution of Charles is a struggle not only about power, but about religion. In fact, throughout the period we're exploring in these lectures, politics and religion are completely inseparable. In the case of wars and executions, we can see that this combination turned not only violent, but deadly. So the reason though I start with Charles I, this sometimes surprises people because I'm supposed to be talking about John Wesley, um, is because you could say, rightly so I think, that Charles haunts the 18th century and he haunts its political culture during the lives of the Wesley brothers. Throughout the period after the restoration of the monarchy, which we'll get into in a minute, following the disaster that was the Cromwellian Commonwealth, 1649 to 1660, the question of the balance of powers will be central to the English political project, as will the role and nature of the church, keeping in mind that the church itself was one of the powers that I'm talking about. At the heart of all this is a French concept, which you don't normally hear about Anglophiles talking about the French concepts and bringing them in as though we like them, but it's called the Ancien Regime, which is traditionally understood to describe the elements of French social and political power. Three elements, and, it, and actually, if, if you imagine something of a three-footed stool, it might actually help. Um, the thing is, the stool seems to teeter back and forth between the three at least in this period. What are the three areas? The monarchy itself, uh, this is the French model, by the way, the monarchy itself with its king, okay? And this is the era of the Louis, if you're wondering. The gentry class, right? The aristocracy is another part of the stool. And then the church. And of course, in the, in the case of the French, we're talking about the Catholic church in France. That's an entirely different lecture, by the way. We're not, we don't need to get into all that. Now, with the case of Louis XIV, this will give you some idea about the Ancien Regime. Louis XIV decided to bring all of this under his control, literally by housing them all in his house. It's called the Palace of Versailles. There's a reason it's so large. Now, this, that never happened in England, by the way. The monarch didn't want to live with all the gentry. But the same structure can be seen in the English context, although with some variation, as I've said. One was that the gentry in England were organized into a parliament, at least part of them, right? Not every member of the gentry is a member of parliament. And parliament did have its own powers, that is, as it had developed over centuries and, and through English tradition. The second is the nature of divine right kingship. The French ideal of ultimate monarchical power was not native to English political ideals. It had always been tempered somehow. The Stuarts, however, had pushed it to its limits, especially under uh, James I. The other major difference, of course, was that the Church of England was Protestant. I should say is Protestant. <laughs> I'll, get phone, I'll get phone calls over that if I don't make that clear. Is Protestant. And within it, there remain competing visions, essentially one vision more Catholic and I'm, notice I'm not saying Roman, I'm saying Catholic as in universal, and then one more reformed. In Westing the Anglicans, I actually talk about the, um, uh, the Church of England is a ship with a Catholic port and a reformed starboard, and it seems to teeter back and forth between the two. Notice they're all stuck on the same ship, though. That's the key. The question then, after the dust is settled, was to balance these interests in the English context and how to avoid political and religious extremism, because after the English Civil Wars and the Commonwealth, uh, it shouldn't surprise anyone, extremism is seen to be linked directly to social turmoil. So what do we have after the Commonwealth? It was Parliament who invites Charles II, Charles II, to be king in 1660. This is 11 years after they'd executed his father. I shouldn't say they. Parliament did not execute Char uh, Charles I. It was a rump parliament and it was probably illegal, but that's again another, lect another lecture. 
But the Cromwellian experiment, right, run by a rump, as I've just said, a probably illegal portion of parliament, then followed by Oliver Cromwell's dictatorship, ended in complete failure. Essentially, Cromwell dies in 1558 and his son takes over, but he has, again, not the same political savvy as his father, and it, and it does unravel very quickly. The, the, the Commonwealth, though, had unleashed social and religious chaos. The church had been stripped of its bishops and its liturgy. The country had actually been stripped of its amusements and its, and its celebration of Christmas. In fact, some historians say that the Puritans bored the English so much they invited the king back. Um, and a very traditional society had lost its monarchy. And, and, and I think there's a sense in which English society never got used to the idea of, of being without the monarchy, even during those uh, 11 years. But the restoration was not a blank slate nor a blank check. The Commonwealth had reintroduced the ideas of monarchical restraint. Charles II was welcomed home, but royal absolutism was not welcomed. But the church is restored. The Church of England, as we know it now, was restored. The bishops were reinstalled or named afresh across the country. Vestments returned, and the prayer book was now allowed again. It had been banned. And, when the, and with this came the first in a series of moves meant to establish the Anglican vision over Christian England. Now, we have to understand, I think it's very important, especially for those of us in the American context, that an established church is not simply to favor one flavor of Christianity over another. That's not really the point of it. Rather, it is to provide a comprehensive Christian culture or an umbrella, if that, if that works, under which the Christians of a nation can worship and be formed in the faith. So I think it's actually very, it's very important not to think of the Church of England then like we would a denomination, even in some ways still to this day. Instead, the Church of England is the, or was, the Christian umbrella under which the Christians of England were then held together. But forces within the establishment, in this case the Puritan faction, had proven to be dangerous. And so with the restoration of the monarchy and the church, we see what's called an act of uniformity, which is a legal act passed by parliament and signed by the king, requiring the clergy to swear fealty to their bishops and to use the prayer book in their worship services. In other words, the official liturgy of the church. What happens then is that nearly 2000 clergy, including both John Wesley's grandfathers, interestingly enough, refused to swear fealty. And on St. Bartholomew's day, 1662, they were ejected is the term, ejected from their livings for not signing on to the act of uniformity. A number, of the, a number of these clergy would get over their qualms, which is what happens sometimes when you take people away from their income. Um, <laughs> some would found illegal meetings. Others would try some sort of balancing act where they'd have a small group of like-minded persons um, meeting in their home, but they'd also attend the local church. It's interesting, they, they try all kinds of ways not to get caught. And in fact, in some cases we found where they they set up tables like they're having a large dinner party and everyone happens to have food in front of them. So if an official comes in the room, they all appear like they're having dinner rather than having a prayer meeting. Some end up in jail, others end up in extreme poverty. But these ecclesiastical rebels, as I'm calling them, introduced into English life the beginnings of a religious marketplace. War for the Tories, one of the leading political groups of the time, and therefore for high churchmen like Samuel Wesley, the, the, the brother's father, by the way, um, and for all three of his, of his sons, this introduces a highly problematic rejection of God's re restorative work. Notice how it's a, it's, a, it's a unique theological perspective that they put on this. Um, in other words, these ecclesiastical rebels don't introduce a, market a marketplace they introduce a problem. And in doing so, they actually, according to this vision, put the entire country in jeopardy of both divine wrath and outright collapse. Never thought small groups could be that powerful, did you? Now, we will get back to the historic narrative in just a second, but I want, to, I want you to understand the implications of a political viewpoint 
that is itself born in, wrapped in, and understood within a theological one. Now, to the high church Tory, which is what the Wesleys all were, not only was the episcopacy, right, the bishops of the church through whom sacramental validity and order is traced, necessary to the church, but from a Tory perspective, the monarch is the arbiter of power, appointed by God. That's key, by the way. I paused too long between those. <laughs> arbiter of power, appointed by God. Parliament then has power given to it by the monarch and tradition. Notice this hierarchy. It's a very important distinction. So the Bartholomeans, as the ones ejected on St. Bartholomew's Day came to be known, um, are not only rejecting God's representatives in the form of the bishops, but also God's representative in the form of Charles II and his parliament. And the implications are not just the introduction of a religious marketplace, but rather the allowance of a form of rebellion. And to give you an idea what some of them thought of this, think of the ancient Israelites who allowed the worship of Baal in the Old Testament. And like the Israelites, it was thought that the British would pay, just like in the Old Testament. You see that, that linkage there? Okay, hopefully the Old Testament scholars in the room like that one. This high church Tory perspective is the perspective of the Wesley family, as I've said, and it can be traced from Samuel Wesley Sr. to all three of his sons, Samuel Wesley Jr., John, and Charles. And we'll see how this plays out across the three lectures this week. There was, however, loyal opposition, and I don't mean the Puritans, by the way, they didn't view them that way after a while. The loyal opposition was the Whigs. Now, I don't want anyone to think of the late 17th and early 18th century as having political parties and organized structures like we do now. Um, we have those in Washington, DC, by the way. Um, it's best to think of the parties of this period as um, overlapping circles of interest some concentric, and therefore organizing general groups of like mind. Now, at the same time as we have that, we have disorganized parties, we do have the fact that the Tories went to their hospital, the Whigs went to their hospital in London, they didn't go to the same coffee shops, they didn't read the same newspapers. In fact, we have stories of somebody pulling up to a party at a house and he sees the, the carriage of a Whig, and as a Tory, he just keeps going, he refuses to go in. There is that. That's not new, by the way. <laughs> and also, you notice they're getting their news sources from news, news um, that actually reinforces their political assumptions. Again, not a new idea. But the emerging balance of power that came with the accession of Charles II, a legally elected parliament and a reestablished church, faced an altogether different challenge in the person of James II, who would be king in 1685. It is thought by many that Charles II converted to Roman Catholicism on his deathbed. It's likely, although it's a rumor, um, but James II was a Roman Catholic, in fact, well before his accession to the throne. And because of this, attempts were actually made to take him out of the line of succession. In fact, there was a rebellion um, in Somerset that tried to remove him the, from the succession. But every time Charles II uh, thwarted these efforts. It's interesting, obviously, because the issue was James's Roman Catholicism, and Charles supposedly didn't support that, but supported his, his brother regardless. So James comes to the throne in 1685, and it's interesting, it doesn't take him very long to reintroduce, at least according to his detractors, elements of that old Stuart penchant for royalist absolutism. And James used his monarchical ideals to promote the acceptance of Roman Catholicism. Now, it's one thing to, to be a Protestant and to have theological reasons why one is not under the authority and teachings of the Bishop of Rome. It's another thing entirely to understand the English aversion to Catholicism in the early modern period. By the way, I was on the, the Methodist Catholic Dialogue for six years and trying to explain some of the venom toward Catholicism that comes out of John Wesley's mouth to Roman Bishop is a very interesting exercise, um, not easy. But here's how I think it's best to understand it. To the English of this period, Roman Catholicism wasn't 
simply a competing theological vision. It was a political vision and one that manipulated the Christian faith to undermine the freedoms of the English people. Now you can see some of the reason why uh, even, even now uh, in the United Methodist Book of Discipline, there's anti-Catholic language in the Articles of Religion transferred over from the Church of England to this day. The other thing is the historical memory of the, of the period is particularly long. And many had read and, and had been formed by Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is a propagandist piece of the, of the, of the highest variety that gave shockingly detailed accounts of executions or martyrdoms, really the heroic ends of Protestant martyrs, including women and children during the reign of Mary Tudor. It's probably likely you've never heard it referred to as Mary Tudor, but instead as Bloody Mary because of that book. Roman Catholicism was then seen as a violent, coercive, and this is important, a foreign influence on English soil. But it wasn't just Bloody Mary or Mary Tudor who had given it a bad name. Although it's, it's, it's hard not to, to see how that she did that in certain ways. Although I will say with some trepidation, um, she is one of the most misunderstood figures in history, but um, I'm not gonna stand up here and try to defend her. <laughs> that, that'll take a, another series of lectures. Um, it, it's hard to forget that, it, that she was the one who called for the execution of Archbishop Cranmer. And of course, it's Cranmer who provides the English with the language of the prayer book. In other words, the way that the English pray and speak of God is, is, has been shaped by this man. And here, she has him burned at the stake in the heart of Oxford. We can't also, we have to remember too that the Pope had excommunicated, excommunicated Elizabeth I and multiple attempts on her life were thought instigated by Catholic powers. During James I's reign, the gunpowder plot had taken place, led in part by a man named Guy Fox. And he had initially, uh, he had actually placed explosives below parliament in an attempt to blow up the entire government in one go. Now, here's another question I think needs to be answered. Why did parliament have public rental spaces under its meeting hall? But that's again, off topic. <laughs> But Catholicism wasn't just a competing theological vision then. It was a corrupt, immoral, and violent foreign influence. And now it sat on the throne. See the problem here? James II had brought about a crisis. How, for example, can the clergy of the Church of England, a Protestant church, function under the leadership of a Roman Catholic monarch? Generally, at the beginning of his reign then, the clergy in particular are watching him with extreme caution. And they're watching in horror as he starts to make moves to bring Catholics into the centers of power, including and particularly the military and in academia. And of course, alarms are raised and many in the church sound the alarm and they do so very loudly. In 1688, so only three years into his reign, James makes efforts to legally make a pathway for both Catholicism and dissent. And he does this in the form of declarations. And there are a couple of them, but there's, these are statements that he wants to be read from the pulpits of the Church of England. The declarations of, of James II, though, is really like playing with fire in a gunpowder factory. The vast majority of the clergy reject, reject them entirely. Least of all, do they agree to read them in their churches. A number of them burn them on the steps, in fact. And this led to trials including the famous trial of the seven bishops, which was an event that spelled doom for James. The bishops would not support his efforts and he locked them up in the tower, the Tower of London. And in their trial, they were all acquitted. Of course, this was a big cause for celebration for the, people, the Protestants of England. The whole episode becomes something of a major PR debacle for James. And in fact, there are prints with portraiture of the seven bishops that are sold across England and framed and put up in homes as a celebration, almost like celebrity photographs. In other words, James's world is beginning to unravel before his eyes. Now, we don't have time for all the details, but in 1688, we see what is later described as the Glorious Revolution. Now, remember the Protestants named it Glorious. 
it's not entirely about religion. I'm, let me make that clear. There were other competing interests at play in this time, including trade partnerships. Never underestimate the power of trade partnerships. But we will focus on religion uh, tonight. It was not, as some Protestants have claimed, a bloodless revolution. In fact, many thousands of Catholics across England died, uh, were killed, or even there were mobs at Rome's streets. But what we see is a political shift as William of Orange and his wife Mary, herself the daughter of James, and therefore a steward, which is important, are welcomed to England as James II flees to France. William and Mary, importantly enough, are Protestants. William, in fact, by the way, is a staunch Calvinist. Um, in fact, the most staunch of, of all the reformed people who have ever sat on the throne, he was the most staunch, to put it that way. Although he does nothing about it in his reign. This is a cause though, of political crisis. On what basis can a king be removed from the throne? For some like Samuel Wesley, this was a particular challenge, but in fact, what James had done was to try to set himself as monarch against the Church of England. It was monarchy against church. Remember the Ancien regime with the three, three sides. Um, in the Glorious Revolution, the Ancien regime of monarchy, church, and parliament shifts. And some have argued it was a shift toward parliament. I and others believe it is an, actually a shift toward the church and that the right name for this event might actually be the Anglican Revolution. I did not come up with that term, by the way, but I, I, I do like it. And so for churchmen like Samuel Wesley, the question will hinge on the church, but it was more than just the church for Samuel. He came to see the revolution and support its aftermath because of three things. One, James II had embraced monarchical absolutism and thus he had to be opposed. Two, James had set himself against the Church of England, even trying to turn some of Oxford's colleges into Catholic seminaries. Three, James had not been run out of the country. He fled and therefore gave up his kingship. This is also, by the way, the official view of the English government. Now, it's in this way of thinking that Samuel, a, a Tory, could accept the results of the revolution and still maintain that God was the source of power given first to monarch and then to parliament. But not all Tories agreed. In fact, one of those Tories who disagreed was a woman named Susanna Wesley. She believed that after one had pledged an oath, and in this case, fealty to the monarch, James II, as long as he was alive or his direct heirs were, were alive, that fealty reigned supreme. And she wasn't alone. Not only had James quickly set up a competing royal court on French soil, he was joined by some of the leading members of the clergy, including the Archbishop of Canterbury. For those of you who don't know English ecclesiastical matters, that's the head of the Church of England in terms of the, the, the highest ranking bishop. Now, so the Tories were in crisis, but the Whigs had no problems with the Glorious Revolution at all. In their mind, it was a triumph of parliament over the monarchy, uh, especially an unfettered monarchy. And it fit within a historical framework um, where they saw um, a historical movement toward increasing freedom. It's called the Whig interpretation of history. John Wesley spoke of the revolution in terms of freedom, but he was not a Whig and he didn't follow that Whig trajectory. Rather, he spoke of freedom from monarchical absolutism, freedom from Catholic interference, and freedom for the Church of England to be truly Protestant. At the heart of it all, Samuel, John, and Charles Wesley saw this as the triumph of Anglicanism. And with the restoration of the church, its episcopacy, episcopacy and liturgy in 1660, the ejection of the Puritans in 1662, the rejection of Catholicism in 1688, and later an act of parliament in 1701, requiring all future monarchs to be communicants in the Church of England. By the way, that act is still in effect. The extremes had been moved, removed from power. What we have is a liturgical Protestant Episcopalian Christianity for the English people. And this, by the way, is when we start to use and see the term Anglican. 
But let's go back for a minute to those ecclesiastical rebels of 1662, because as you probably know, they don't just disappear. And to help you understand who I'm talking about, these groups were called independents, Baptists, and Congregationalists. You can see they're, they're still around. <laughs> they, partook, they, they partook of much of what was left of Puritan culture. And many thought that they upheld the principles of the English reformers and the reforms of the 16th century carried to its logical end. Many claimed to, pro to proclaim the old divinity, that's what they called it, meaning the doctrines of the English Reformation, particularly from a reformed or Calvinistic perspective. And in fact, until the rise of the evangelicals in, 1730, in the 1730s, these dissenters from the standard bearers of Calvinistic thought, even if, I'm sorry, these dissenters were the standard bearers of Calvinistic thought, even if not all evangelicals and not all dissenters uh, were in fact Calvinists. In terms of numbers, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, it must be kept in mind that in 1700, 93% of the population was connected to the Church of England, 93%. So dissent, Roman Catholics, Unitarians, and others uh, made up the remaining 7%. So it's not a huge part of the, of the population, but a noticeable one. But dissent included some of the great minds of the day, in particular, some of the great literary minds, such as Daniel Defoe, John Bunyan, Isaac Watts, I've probably sung some of his hymns recently, and William Blake. These also include Richard Baxter, who is one of Wesley's favorite authors, particularly related to the pastoral life. And from 1662, and by the way, amazingly enough, Susanna is buried in the midst of most of these men, Susanna the Great um, High Church Tory, uh, in her dissenting burial ground. Some irony there. Now, from 1662 until 1689, the passage of the Act of Toleration, um, between that period until the Act of, of Toleration, these dissenters, as they were called, actually met illegally. But in 1689, with the failure of efforts to bring nonconformist Trinitarians back into the Church of England and the Anglican fold, the dissenters were actually given legal protections to meet for worship. Now, we shouldn't think that these protections made dissent an easy option, as both social and political structures of the day made it clear that anyone outside of the Church of England and the established church was in fact a second-class citizen. But it did allow them to have meeting houses off of the main street, that was key. They could have leaders, they could have dissenting academies, and they could essentially have a life of their own. Some see this move as the beginning of efforts to disestablish Anglicanism, but I think that's going too far in this period. Interestingly, though, both Samuel and Susanna will grow up amongst dissent. And uh, in, their, in their teenage years, um, they would actually then turn uh, to the establishment. While dissenters were generally barred from political activity in the form of office holding, they did begin to support a, uh, the Whig ascendancy as it offered them more freedoms. If you study early evangelicalism, and by the way, Methodism is simply a subset of that larger group, you will see interaction between evangelicals and dissent, some of it based on shared reformed theological convictions, some on the devotional literature produced by both groups, and some because of early evangelicalism's openness to include dissenters in their small group activities. But what we see emerging with a restored monarch church and now dissent with the extremes of Puritanism, Roman Catholicism and arbitrary monarchical, monarchical power held at bay is the political and religious context in which the Wesleys will live and in which their own political opinions are formed. At the heart of this, however, is what some have termed the Tory crisis of faith. And something that William Gibson has written about ex uh, extensively, in particular in a new volume that I highly recommend to you on Samuel Wesley. The Tory view of this emerging world, despite restored monarch and restored church, is one of competing allegiances. While the Stuarts under James II, his son titled James III, by the way, 
and then grandson, popularly known as Bonnie Prince Charlie, set up a competing court in France, they will continue to wield influence. The monarchy in England will continue under William and Mary until Mary's early death, followed by Williams in 1702. He will be followed by Anne, who is the last of the Stuarts on the throne. She was a darling of the Tory churchmen, by the way, they loved her. She will die in 1714 and be followed by her cousin, the Hanoverian George I. And we'll talk more about him tomorrow. We will see how this plays out in John Wesley's life uh, tomorrow night in particular, because the Stuarts refused to give up easily and launched two massive rebellions, both in 1715 and 1745. But all of this, in particular to a Tory of the high church wing of the Anglican establishment, was not simply a matter of politics, but of theology. And questions will linger for Tories in the period including the nature of kingship, the defense of the Church of England, the implications of public morality, or more importantly, the lack thereof to the welfare of the state in the eyes of God, including whether allowing dissent to exist at all was an act of immorality on the part of society. We'll see again the role of oaths taken and the, def and the de deference that should be shown to those who rule. This is the political world of John Wesley. And my hope tomorrow is to see him within that world that I've tried to lay out for you tonight. The following night, our concluding time together, my aim is to try to find themes from Wesley's political engagement understood within its context that can then be applicable to our own context. Even though, as you probably have noticed, the political context I've described is very different from our own. So as you can imagine already, that last lecture is gonna be the most difficult one of all. But all the same, I believe that I found some meaningful themes that will be of use to us in our context where monarchists and Tories are not often found. And I look forward to exploring that more with you tomorrow. All right, it's a lot of complicated history that we got there. Thank you so much, Dr. Nader. Yeah. Well, we have our first response. It's going to come from Dr. O'Reilly, O'Reilly, and that is going to be on the screen here. And so, Dr. O'Reilly had the paper ahead of time, and this will be our first response. And maybe I'll give you a chance to think about questions you might like to ask, Dr. Denker. Good evening, friends. The invitation to offer a response to Dr. Denker's initial lecture this evening is daunting, to say the least. The relationship between politics and theology in our day is complex in its own right. Articulating the dynamics of the political and theological climate of a previous age is even more so. I'm grateful to my friend, Dr. Ryan Denker, for ably orienting us to the key figures, parties, and questions crucial to understanding John Wesley's own political context. And by way of response, I'll reflect on two major impressions and highlight a few questions that arose for me in the course of the lecture. First, I cannot help but highlight what feels like a very, very wide gulf between Wesley's political context and my own. As a citizen of a democratic republic, the notion that a monarch rules by divine right is altogether foreign and to some extent, worrisome. And while I've long been familiar with this doctrine, this lecture has reinforced for me that such a belief, that is that an individual rules on God's behalf, is ripe for abuse. And as we heard in this evening's lecture, there were kings who acted foolishly and at times dangerously. The sort of tension that arises in such a setting certainly came across in the lecture, not least with the differing attitudes toward the king embodied by John Wesley's own parents. This wide gulf between 18th century monarchism and various 21st century democratic systems will need to be addressed in the development of a Wesleyan approach to political theology. I suspect we'll hear more about that in the remaining lectures this week.
My second observation has to do with how the church creates culture. I found myself considering the value and utility of what may be called a top-down or hierarchical approach to the cultivation of Christian culture. I take the formal institutional partnership between an ecclesial body and a governing political body, like that in Wesley's own context, as essential to this top-down approach. As we find in the Act of Uniformity, with this arrangement, the government authorizes a set of universal norms for worship and practice. This approach has the benefit of cultivating a very specific sort of culture, but it has the liability of irresistibly imposing that culture on the constituents of the nation. An alternative might be a bottom-up or grassroots approach to Christian culture building. Here the government and the church have no formal or institutional relationship. The church is responsible for the work of disciple-making, which would involve disciples producing the sort of distinctively Christian art, music, politics, research, and social institutions that make up culture. The liability is that there is no ordered or decreed trajectory. You can't ensure the outcome. The advantage is that a variety of cultural achievements could be fostered when a hierarchical norm is not imposed. The bottom-up approach seems to me represented by the Ryan, why don't I give you a chance just to respond already here, and then if we get it back up, we just don't want to lose the kind of live space that we have. I, mean, I know he was probably leading to a place where he's going to have a question, but th there, there is, and he's highlighted for us, like, clear tension. So you want to just hit on that, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, we're, yeah, we're going to run into that tension all three nights. Um, and, and I think that's, that's why I've gone with themes um, I wish Matt was here. I could look at him. Um, here's a mat, a couple of mats. Um, yeah, that's right. I, I mean, that, that really is the tension. Um, and it, and it means, I think part of my issue and one of the reasons I've given you so much context is not only because I'm a historian and I think context is king, but, um, it's too easy to take John Wesley out of his context and then make him say what we want him to. Um, and I'll go off on that in the third lecture. Um, I could do a little now. <laughs> well, I mean, but that, but, but actually the, the reality is it doesn't, you know, different political systems have things to teach one another I can put it that way. Um, and I think one thing we'll see, uh, especially in the third one, is the whole Tory um, concept of deference is something completely lacking in our political discourse. Um, you know, Washington is the most polite, polite city about politics. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> and, and that's something that that system, in fact, instilled in people. Um, and of course, I, something that I don't know if Matt was going to pick up on this or not, but I ultimately think that divine right kingship was was actually foreign to English political ideology, and that the 17th century proved that it was foreign to their political thinking. Um, and in fact, maybe that will assuage some of his concerns about the idea, because uh, I know that really that seemed to strike Matt, um, the idea that, that in fact the monarch was the mouthpiece of God. At the same time, divine right kingship took seriously the fact that God should be part of the equation when we're talking about government. And I think that's something that this period can teach us. Um, because if you believe in divine right kingship, you're immediate. Notice the first word. It's not king. It's divine. And so, um, and so what that does is it produces, at minimum, the imagination of a providential world. You can't look at society without seeing providence. Right. And therefore, I see some good in it. Um, uh, that might be, you know, <laughs> interesting for an American to say something nice about divine right kingship. Uh, and like I said, I even think that it's foreign. I really think it's much more French than English. But 
At the same time, it demands that we address politics and not try to act in Wesleyan words as a practical atheist when it comes to our political engagement. So um, these are some of the ways I've been trying to creatively look at the context while at the same time taking seriously the gulf that, that Matt obviously highlights. So um, yeah, Jeff, do we have the rest of his? Okay. 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 Um, I'll, let me follow up on that a little bit. So, as a music student, uh, I did my undergrad in music. Mm -hmm. I was uh, became fan and learned a lot about that great German who loved British, the British world. Handel, mm -hmm. right? And Handel, in one of the pieces that you end up knowing about him, is a famous piece, Zadok the Priest. Mm -hmm. And that that piece comes up, and you use the Old Testament imagery to think about that moment when the king or queen. Like the, the oil is brought and is said to be the moment, right? Where the anointing, the, the, the monarch. anointing of the monarch happens that God reaches down and touches that moment. And that mm -hmm. obviously is entirely foreign to our ears, like to, to think about that. And, but, but notice too, like we, in our time, no matter what political party you have, the, it, it depends on, you know, what you yeah. favor, people want to say, this is God's person. Yeah. Unless it's not my political party, right? <laughs> I'm just curious to your comments on yeah. that. Yeah, okay, so a couple of things about, so the coronation, which hopefully we don't witness for many, many decades, um, is at its, at its root is a religious ceremony. Of course, it's taking place in Westminster Abbey um, and you know, surrounded by so many of the, the tombs of the kings and queens of England. It's worth flying to London just to go into that building, by the way. It's a, it's a tour de force of English history. They will charge you about $25 to get in, but it's worth it. Um, the, at the heart of that, they actually, so they dress the monarch in priestly vestments. Um, it's still part of the, um, of the ceremony and the monarch is anointed. Yeah. In fact, by the way, the, the spoon that they use for the, for the anointing oil is the oldest piece of regalia in the coronation rite that we have, because it actually survived Oliver Cromwell, who, who melted down all the crown jewels. Um, so, so there's a sense in which, yeah, the, the monarch has a priestly role, but here's the thing, I'm gonna disagree with you, Andy. I think we have the, some, uh, not the same, but a similar expectation of the president. Right. It, but the thing is, we don't call it a priestly role. We call it acting presidentially. And what that means, and I think this, this is something I, it's not my idea, but it's something I gleaned from a, a friend of mine who belongs to a different party than I do. Um, he said that we expect our presidents to actually function as the high priest of our civil religion. And that involves acting presidentially in certain spheres I mean, we even don't even, sometimes we don't like it if the president doesn't wear a dark suit. I remember there was one point where Obama wore a brown suit and everybody had a fit about it. It goes back to the expectation. We have certain, you know, expectations of, of the president. I mean, Trump almost blew all that out of the water, but there's a sense, there's a sense in which, think of the laying of the wreath at, the, um, at Arlington Cemetery that's done by the president. It's a, it's a, it is a liturgy. It's a formal ritual done on behalf of the American people in deference to the military and respect of the person who is buried in that in the unknown soldier's tomb. Now, I'm not saying they're exactly the same. And I'm not saying it's, you know, I'm not saying they're a priest, but I think there are interesting correlations between some of the, the traditional expectations of power, of, of monarchical power connected to the church and the way that even in our secular go government, we have certain expectations of the federal head acting on our behalf in something of a priestly fashion. So some of these things actually translate in unique and it, ways. It, and I appreciate you bringing up like that there's a theological dimension to that when we bring that up. So sure. all right, Craig Campbell, one of our students has a question. And then I think, and then Ethan has one after that. Um, he says, I found the fact that just 7% of the population were not of the Church of England, yet so many of the intellectual and or theological visionaries or leaders were in that minority. Was there a lot of antagonism between the 93 and the seven? And how did that affect the social or religious chaos? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, 
I mean, it's one thing to list out some of the luminaries of the minority. If I was to list out the luminaries of the majority, we'd be here all night. I think we have to keep that in mind. <laughs> um, at the same time, the dissenters were intentional in a way that the rest of the society didn't have to be. Um, and we'll see this again um, with the Jacobites, the non-juror Jacobites. Well, they'll start out our next lecture. They're the ones who reject the Hanoverians um, and they reject the Glorious Revolution, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of uh, really deep thinkers in the Anglican tradition will be a part of that small group too. Um, I think it's because these are people who are passionate about what they're doing. They're at the center of power. They are affected in different ways. The other thing about the dissenting groups, and remember within that 7%, I included Roman Catholics, um, Unitarians, um, you've got you know, the various Baptists, independents, et cetera, et cetera. You had some, some people are just flat out heretics. Um, you, you, they're the ones who are the bearers of the reform tradition. And I think we have to remember that the reform tradition has such a strong emphasis on scholarship because the leadership in the reform tradition are the scholars, those who you know, expound on scripture. Uh, think of how Calvin, his sermons were hours long, by the way, <laughs> and he would expound on scripture. Um, within, within the Anglican tradition, it's, there's still a lot of strong reformed influence. Um, but it's not that kind of intentional uh, exposition of scripture. So these people are gonna stick out in certain ways that I think are highlighted. The other thing about Puritan culture that is interesting to those of us who are connected to the Wesleyan world is that this is where you find a lot of the devotional literature of the time. Not all of it. Um, by the way, the other wing that will produce devotional literature is the high church wing. Um, and um, in fact, it's the high church wing uh, whose devotional literature will eventually convert George Whitfield ironically to evangelicalism, not to the high church, but that's again, a different story. But anyway, I think that the, hopefully that kind of addresses some of that. Um, but again, we, you know, I could stand up here and list the Anglican luminaries. We'd be here a long, long time. Yeah, yeah, Ethan. Yeah, thank you, Randy. Sure, all right, next, Ron, all right. Come on up here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ron, you mentioned that in 1745, there was a failed rebellion of Stuart dynasty. Yeah. Could you comment a little bit? Because obviously that's not long before Wesley. So, you know. Oh, like, he's alive. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's in his <laughs> lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, you know. So could you comment a little bit on the cultural sensitivity to change when Wesley comes along and the idea of maybe doing things a little differently was how sensitive was English society to Wesley mm. when his movement begins? Mm, yeah, yeah. And, and tomorrow I'll talk about the rebellions um, because it's interesting. Methodism arises in between those rebellions. And I think that's important to keep in mind because those rebellions represent um, political, social, and theological instability. And here we had John Wesley. Okay, uh, John Wesley was much more of a rebel and troublemaker than we actually give him credit for. And I don't mean that theologically. Theologically, I don't think he was that creative, but, um, he set up a system of societies that were not under the direct oversight of the bishops. In fact, were not under the direct oversight of the parish priests. He organized a group of laymen under his control to go around the country preaching an on, on an itinerant system. And actually what this looked like was um, a similar pattern to what the Puritans had done in England before the English Civil Wars broke out. They're the ones who were doing field preaching in the 1740s, the 1640s, 30s and 40s. They were the ones with the small groups. <laughs> they were the ones, in fact, talking about heart religion. Um, and so when John Wesley mimics in certain ways the, the Puritans who then, whose efforts later fueled into the English Civil Wars, um, it was highly volatile. And in fact, I've written a book about that. Um, <laughs> the, the situation was, was extreme because what Wesley is doing, in fact, is he's abusing the system. Um, he found, it's funny, my, my, my doctoral advisor, um, David Hempton, 
he, we would always get into it. I said, was Wesley politically um, naive and just didn't look at the situation? Or was he so astute that he read the, the tea leaves in such a way that he got away with what he was doing? And we'd go back and forth as to which perspective might be right. Um, Wesley found within the laws, the, since he was an Anglican priest, right? He was a part of the establishment. And that's something to keep in mind. The Wesley brothers were Oxford trained Anglican priests. They were under the authority of the Bishop of London. I mean, you, you know, they were part of all this. Here, not as dissenters, but as churchmen, they're setting up these essentially illegal small groups. Um, there's some clashes, especially with the evangelical parishes. Um, there's clashes with other groups because you get these, these interesting, um, well, think of it this way, all right. Someone, let's put it in our modern context. Someone sets up a small group ministry near your church take some of your church members, says, we're not going to really take them from you. We're just going to have them on Wednesdays. Requires tickets to get in. Um, they confess their sins to one another. You sometimes spread them, you know, group them into smaller groups. Um, and there's this really intense form of spirituality. And in fact, they start to question whether everybody in their home church is really saved or not. Um, Think about the trouble you would cause in a modern context. Now, put that into the political context I've just described. And it, it really is quite the mess. Um, now, in 40, in the, because of the 45, right? I mean, it's funny. I'll talk about this tomorrow. But John Wesley, actually, he, he tries to show his Hanoverian stripes very bluntly. In fact, he even writes up a, a piece to be published across the country of Methodist support for George uh, the second, right? This 45 of in George the second. And uh, Charles Wesley and a, and a clergyman named Samuel Walker talk him out of this, not because they don't support the Hanoverians, but because they don't want the Methodists to seem like they're separate from the Church of England and therefore dissenters. And so it's all this mix, right, of monarchical interests, dynastic interests, church versus dissent interests, and all these other things. Yeah, Methodism is, is this interesting collision of all these things. And, and it's quite, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing, actually, that it didn't um, blow up more than it did. One last thing, Andy. Okay. When you're thinking about why mobs rose up against John Wesley, maybe I just answered the question. Mm. I, I still remember, you know, when you first hear about John Wesley, and all of a sudden they talk mm. about the mobs who would rise up against him. You think this poor man is just talking to them about Jesus, and look what they do. No, <laughs> this, this man burrows under the political uh, scene and causes issues. And the mob is actually how local authorities maintain the peace in their village. Different, different uh, scenario. All of a sudden, the mob isn't so horrible, um, <laughs> strangely enough to say. We might be able, we have Dr. Friedman has a question, and then we've figured out how to get Dr. O'Reilly's last okay. two minutes. All right. But let's go ahead and. So the divine right of king, divine right kingship, any any linkage uh, with that to the four mentions of God in the Declaration of Independence, first off, and then Ooh. second off, what does all this backdrop have to do with uh, when John Wesley starts critiquing uh, the colonies for the war yeah. and for slavery, mm -hmm. which clearly irritated, uh, at least the first part of that clearly irritated Francis Asbury. Starts calling him Daddy Wesley, I think, at that point. Yeah, Papa West, pa Papa John. Um, <laughs> he does. He says I once. Yeah, not not just pizza. Um, okay, there are a couple questions in there, Matt. <laughs> uh, I divine right kingship, I think, has little to nothing to do with the Declaration, um, because I think really what you see in the founding fathers of this country. Uh, initially is a Whig royalist rebellion. And there's been fascinating work that, that's come out of Harvard um, about the nature of royalist Whig political thought at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. Now, it's not necessarily in New England. The New Englanders were always a bit more hot-headed. Um, I think I can say that since I lived up there for a while. <laughs> but the idea was that Parliament had somehow undermined proper um, monarchical governance, 
and in fact, had, Parliament was the one who was imposing these taxes on tea and candles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, you know, in the early, early arguments around the revolution, you see these arguments to say, we need to return to um, a place where Parliament's doing its job and the king is in fact, almost, almost working, almost to keep each other in check. Um, in that context, divine right of kings is not, not, on, the car, not on the cards. Now, um, what was your second question? Uh, the backdrop of everything we talked about tonight with John Wesley's events of the of the war. Yep. And of Memphis Lincoln. Yeah. Um, I'll get to that tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll give you this idea. At, at the root, well, okay. He was a monarchist and these people were eventually against monarchs. That was a big problem for Wesley. But he actually argues, and I'll, like I said, I'll go into this a little bit more tomorrow. He argues that they're undermining the liberties they have as Englishmen. And there's no guarantee of them after they win. So he doesn't trust that the American Revolution will produce freedom. And he says, why are you turning away the liberty you have, which is the best in the world, as he calls it? You're giving this up uh, for an unknown future with no guarantees. That, that's his critique. Uh, slavery is going to be a theological critique, very blunt theological critique. You're failing to see these people as made in the image of God. And then the repercussions of, a, of theology of the Imago Dei, which we'll work with tomorrow and on Wednesday, actually. Oh, what a great close, moving right into oh, look at that. people. <laughs> we want them to come back, right? <laughs> so this is good. Maybe what we'll do tomorrow is we'll, if it's okay if you start with Dr. O'Reilly's question, and maybe I'll be a way just to kind of set the stage again for where we've been and working through this period. Let's just close in prayer. And then we'll get those of you who have classes tonight. We'll see you there in a few minutes, particularly my preaching class. See you in a few minutes. Jesus, thank you for the way that you are at work in our world. We thank you that every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the father of heavenly lights who does not change like the shifting shadows. We adore you because you are at work in the world, that you haven't left us by yourself, and that we have the opportunity to be able to find the ways you are moving. And we think that that happens in the political sphere. Give us wisdom as we work through this in the life of John Wesley here, as we attempt to understand what's going on there, so that we might even understand how you're calling us and what you're calling us to do in our time. We say this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you all tomorrow. God bless you.